Oh, now I see you. Oh, okay. All right, good. We'll wait one more minute, but I guess we're gonna be a diminished crowd a little bit tonight. I'm sure. Okay, well, let's, let's dive in. Um, welcome to the final lecture in the 2022 Drome Lecture Series, Dirty Words, The Selective Survival of Latin Erotica from St. Jerome to Mr. Jerome. And our lecture tonight is entitled, Uranian Love Goes Underground. Uh, and very sadly, as we've all <laughs> just realized, uh, Professor Richland will be addressing us over Zoom this evening because of a positive COVID test. That's the bad news, but the good news is she's feeling well and just had this sort of unfortunate test. So we're gonna proceed on Zoom and uh, I'll say a little bit about the lecture series. I know some of you are at the first and second and have heard some of this introduction before, but it bears repeating. Um, so the Thomas Spencer Jerome Lecture Series is among the most prestigious and field-defining international platforms for the presentation of new work on Roman history and culture. The Jerome Lectures are delivered both at the American Academy in Rome and at the University of Michigan. And Professor Richland was first in Michigan and then came to us. Amy Richland is Distinguished Professor, Distinguished Research Professor of Classics at the University of California, Los Angeles, and is our Jerome Lecture in the series 49th year. Uh, so that's wonderful. Not quite the halfway mark, not the 50th, but very good. Tonight's lecture is the conclusion of a journey we've taken this last week through ancient and modern gender and sex systems and practices. Professor Richland's lecture has forced us to consider the trajectory of same-sex relations from the ancients to the Victorians and beyond. And these lectures are deeply interdisciplinary and boundary crossing in the best, best sense of the word as they've moved us across time and space, across different social uh, systems and peri historical periods. Um, and they are forcing us to think about the continuities and ruptures in sex and sexuality over time. So I wanna thank Professor Richland for a week of thought-provoking exchange at both the lectures and in her time here at the Academy where she has participated in many dinner, lunch, and coffee conversations uh, with the fellows and the community. I realize that Professor Richland and her work have been introduced several times this week but as I said, her groundbreaking and wide-ranging career bear repeating. Professor Richland is a leading historian of Roman society and culture with a particular focus on women's and gender history, Roman comedy and satire, and the history of sexuality. Professor Richland's work has shaped the field of Roman history with innovative scholarship on the lives of women, slaves, sexual minorities, and indigenous people peoples in the provinces. She wrestles brilliantly with the challenges of excavating the voices and lived experience of people who left very little in the way of written record. In addition to a vast body of work on Roman subaltern groups, Professor Richland has written extensively on satire in the Roman world. Her first book was The Garden of Priapus, Sexuality and Aggression in Roman Humor from 1983 she continued in this vein with two collections, Pornography and Representation in Greece and Rome from 1992 and Feminist Theory and the Classics from 1993. In 2005, Professor Richland translated and published three plays by Plautus that elucidated Roman attitudes toward the Near East and Africa. And that was entitled Rome and the Mysterious Orient. More recently, she has turned her scholarly lens on slavery and human trafficking, as in her 2017 book, Slave Theater in the Roman Republic, Plautus and Popular Comedy, which was awarded the Goodwin Prize from the Society for Classical Studies. 
In addition to her field-defining books, Professor Richland has written 56 articles, ranging from Foucault, Feminism, and the Classics, to owners and slaves around Plautus. She has been a recipient of numerous fellowships and grants, including from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Loeb Foundation. Now, before I turn it over to Professor Richland virtually, I wanna thank the University of Michigan for its collaboration, and Julia Bada and Stefano Jenna here at the American Academy for their work on organizing today's event. At the end of the lecture, we'll have a Zoom question and answer period, and then we have actually organized uh, a reception, so please stay for a glass of Prosecco. We can stand under the portico and not get wet, and we will raise our glasses to Amy and wish her a quick negative test, maybe, to be home for Thanksgiving. With mm -hmm. that, thank you, Professor Richland. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you once again, Marla. Let's see, yeah. Again, I must thank you all for the generous hospitality of the American Academy in Rome, which has certainly lived up to its reputation. 50 years ago in the summer of 1972, I overstayed my trip to the island of Capri, maybe an omen of today's lecture and our current predicament. <laughs> Lon and I are very grateful for your kindness. And I don't know if you're getting the mirror effect that I'm getting here where there's two of me, but it's very disconcerting. I hope it's not for you. One is backwards, but which one? In this last of seven lectures, I'm going to be briefer than usual in order to allow plenty of time for discussion. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts, which I know will be helpful. As the history of the reading of pederastic poetry reaches the 20th century, we cannot avoid the main event, the trial of Oscar Wilde for gross indecency on April 26, 1895. All right, and I should have been sharing my screen all along here. And here it is on the wrong slide. I'm sorry, this is gonna take a minute. Okay. Right. It's going to take more than a minute. Do you want to go to from the beginning? All right. All right. Um, okay. I am not going to be able to. Wait a minute. Maybe I can make the slideshow go. To slideshow. Go to slideshow at the top there. Right. I have a bar covering it. There's a bar covering it that I can't get rid of uh, from. Um, from Zoom. Okay. Uh, fine. All right. I'll just, uh, we'll have to do it the ugly way. Can you click slideshow on the bottom? Amy, I think this is worth figuring out so that we have the full screen of your PowerPoint. Right. Can you see? Can I click slideshow on the bottom? Um, well, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I can. Uh, there we go. Okay, good. Okay, bravo. Okay, thank you. I've never done that before. All right. Um, all right, so the main event, the trial of Oscar Wilde for gross indecency on April 26, 1895. Wilde's success in the public eye goes back to the early, uh, okay, have you, let's see, is my video gone? No. Okay. Um, sorry, Wilde's success in the public eye goes back to the early 1880s when he first became known around London as one of the aesthetic poets. So that Gilbert and Sullivan wrote their operetta Patience more or less about him. As the lead character sings, explaining what to do if you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line, he suggests an attachment a la Plato for a bashful young potato or a not too French, French, a French bean. All right. This line is among the many examples we've seen of how to talk about sex without mentioning sex. 
the attachment a la Plato means platonic love, but it also means love as in Plato's symposium or Greek love. Then, because Wilde was famous for walking around carrying a lily, the poet's loves are vegetable, which would certainly not suit me as an imagined kibitzer in the song comments. But his loves are also specified as bashful and young, and also not too French, if you know what I mean. And I'm sorry, I just have to stop and ask again, do you have video of me or no? No, Amy, we don't, and it's a little bit hard to hear you. Okay. It's very hard to hear you. Um, Lamy has suggested subtitles. I, I don't understand the technology well enough. Can, is that something we can turn on? No, I don't understand why my video has, has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can, all right. Let's try it no, again. But the pro right. Amy, the problem is not the video. It's it's here understanding the. All right, good. I will lean into the microphone more. Okay. All right. There. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Can people hear? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think stay at a consistent distance from the microphone. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so this is a take of this Gilbert and Sullivan operetta was a takeoff on Oscar Wilde and the other aesthetic poets, um, and uh, his love has been uh, suggested by the singer in Gilbert and Sullivan as um, a passion a la Plato for a bashful young potato or a not too fresh, the French, fresh, French bean, um, a line which is on the handout. And for those of you watching on Zoom, the handout is available as a Google Doc um, somewhere in this technological web. Okay, the audience of Gilbert and Sullivan could know what was being talked about without having to know what was being talked about. And so Wilde was sent on a tour of the United States as a publicity stunt for the American run of patients, speaking to sellout crowds and reaching San Francisco in 1882. He was remembered long afterwards. Someone in Kansas wrote in to the underground homosexual magazine, which is what they called it, one in the 1950s, to recall seeing him waving from the platform of his train. Great, and the PowerPoint is not advancing. Um, for reasons that are unclear to me, all right. All right, I don't know what to do about this. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so there's no, let's try. Ah, okay, good. All right. But once Wilde was back in London, things went downhill. Wilde got involved with Lord Alfred Douglas, who in turn got him involved with young male prostitutes. And this became so blatant that Wilde was prosecuted in 1895. The transcript of his trial has some famous lines. This is number one on the handout. Charles Gill, who is prosecuting. What is quote, the love that dare not speak its name, wild. The love that dare not speak its name in this century is such a great affection of an elder for a younger man as there was between David and Jonathan, such as Plato made the very basis of his philosophy, and such as you find in the sonnets of Michelangelo and Shakespeare. It is that deep spiritual affection that is as pure as it is perfect. It dictates and pervades great works of art, like those of Shakespeare and Michelangelo, and those two letters of mine, such as they are. It is in this century misunderstood, so much misunderstood that it may be described as the love that dare not speak its name. And on that account of it, I am placed where I am now. It is beautiful, it is fine. It is the noblest form of affection. There is nothing unnatural about it. It is intellectual and it repeatedly exists between an older and a younger man when the older man has intellect 
and the younger man has all the joy, hope, and glamour of life before him. That it should be so, the world does not understand. The world mocks at it and sometimes puts one in the pillory for it. Wilde did himself no favors with his speech, but it's full of tropes that we've seen before and that would be repeated many times in the 20th century. Model figures are invoked, David and Jonathan, Plato, Michelangelo, and Shakespeare. The love is specified twice as being between an elder and a younger man, but it's pure, beautiful, and fine. It's connected with great works of art. It's noblest, perhaps a glance at what Keynes Jackson would call the new chivalry intellectual and not unnatural. It's a religious reference. And it can put you in the pillory, which as I discussed in the last lecture, was literally true around 1800. Wilde himself was sentenced to hard labor in Reading jail. But today I wanna to introduce you to some much more obscure figures who better represent the rank and file. That is the circle of men connected with a strange periodical called the Artist and Journal of Home Culture. And here I must thank Laurel Brake for getting me started. All right, can everybody hear okay? Say amen, somebody. Okay, good, all right. In 19, sorry, in 1888, a young London solicitor named Charles Keynes Jackson was hired to edit a review of the arts called the Artist and Journal of Home Culture. And the odd title is the result, and this is hard to believe, of an attempt to jack up circulation by appealing to an audience of women who are interested in home decoration. Um, this publication is famous among scholars of the fin de siècle, and it came as a shock to me to find that it is not illustrated, and the print is about the size of what's in the telephone book, for those of you who remember telephone books. It is very, very small. And you'll see online people claiming that the journal printed von Gluden's photographs, but that's not at all true. It's just a solid desert of small type. It was quite a trudge to read the pertinent print run. For Keynes Jackson's time with the Artists and Journal of Home Culture didn't last long. He was fired in 1894 for publishing his own essay titled The New Chivalry an essay promoting military virtue alongside pederasty. Before this, while he was editor, there were constant hints of homophile sentiment, but you do have to look hard to find it. He took as his colleague, a man named Joseph Gleason White, who lived with his wife in the small town of Christchurch on the south coast of England, where they kept a lending library and stationers. The building now houses a chain drugstore, though there's a blue and white plaque on the wall commemorating Gleason White's time there. The plaque mentions only White's tenure as editor of another journal, The Studio, which indeed did publish von Gloden's photographs of boys. And see the discussion in Christopher Reed's book on your bibliography. Uh, the Studio was a serious photography journal. White himself was a recognized authority on photography and traveled in America. The catalog of his books that were sold on his death includes a copy of Walt Whitman's complete prose, the poems and prose, 1855 to 88. The cataloger notes, and this is number two on your handout, very scarce edition, presentation copy to Gleason White from the author, November 4th, 1890. On the flyleaf are mounted some pressed flowers with the inscription in Gleason White's handwriting, given me by Walt Whit or by W. W. from Posey on his table, Camden, N.J., November fourth, eighteen ninety, G. W. Book plate by and the cataloger notes that the book plate is by Charles Ricketts. The pressed flowers take us back to Billy Johnson and his copy of Ionica. Even the book plate has overtones for Ricketts was a friend of Oscar Wilde and indeed all the aesthetic poets and artists went in for the art of the book. But much more could be said on that blue plaque for White's house was the social center for a group that would now be defined as pedophiles. For a while Baron Corvo was a neighbor 
as was Keynes Jackson. Wow. And this is the most shocking photograph I have in the, these PowerPoints. Um, John Gambrel Nicholson used to visit them with his beloved schoolboy, Alec Melling, to whom Nicholson dedicated a book of poems. Uh, this blurry photograph has very often been reproduced. But I have no idea where the original is. Um, Nicholson was among the so-called Uranian poets who were notable for their focus on boys in particular. I mean, if, and if you want to know what boy means, this picture spells it out. Um, let's see. Okay, so the classical model of adult male plus adolescent boy was exactly what the Uranians had in mind. Indeed, the name Uranian derives from the description of the two Aphrodites in the Uranian's totemic book, Plato's Symposium. The love of women belongs to Aphrodite Pandemos, a uh, vulgar Aphrodite, while the loves of boys belong, belongs to Aphrodite Urania, heavenly Aphrodite. It was Keynes Jackson's idea as editor to use the artist and journal of home culture as a conveyor of Uranian verse essays and reviews. And for more on the Uranian, see Jane Stevenson's essay, which is available through Janet to people at the AAR, as well as the definitive books by Timothy Darch Smith and Brian Reed. I mentioned Baron Corvo as part of this group. This is another significant name. He was not a real baron, more of a con artist. And he is the subject of a great biography by A.J.A. Simons called The Quest for Corvo, one of the first biographies to be about the process of trying to write a biography. According to his brother Julian, A.J.A. Simons himself shamelessly juggled the actual order of events, but his account of his first discovery of what Corvo was up to is worth it. And this is number three on your handout. So this is Simon's writing. How well I remember that midnight when, alone in my tiny study, I sat down to read Millard's mysterious book. It contained, I found, typescripts of 23 long letters and two telegrams, forming a series addressed from Venice in the years 1909 to 1910 to an unnamed correspondent. And as I read, my hair began to rise. In, uh, Simons never actually gets around to quoting or even paraphrasing, but by the end of the biography, it's clear that Corvo was in Venice as a sex tourist, a role we'll see again in today's lecture. What I wanna do now is give you a sense of the relationship between the artist and journal of home culture writers and the classical texts they profess to admire. <clears throat> in July 1889, there appeared an odd list of subjects for pictures, which takes us off the well-beaten track of most of the classical references in the journal. <clears throat> These are presented as topics from the classical past, historic or mythological, that would make good ac academy paintings and are rarely or never seen. The list includes Perseus and Andromeda with recommendations on how to show Perseus, Hyacinthus and Apollo, Narcissus, Plato, and Agathon, <coughs> Plato and Agathon together. And the writer comments, if Plato was only 20 when he wrote this epigram, why not? Uh, Agathon may fairly be assumed as some five or six years younger. And then he imagines the broad shouldered stalwart frame of the poet philosopher. Then he imagines Electrion, a boy set to stand guard while Mars was with Venus. It was a very obscure um, and even more obscure Tunnies, bound and cast adrift in a boat by his cruel father. And somebody calls Eolas, the youthful favorite of Hercules. And also the rites of Diana Orthia, a Spartan ritual during which boys were flogged. A second list appeared in October and includes Bathyllus, the boy beloved by Anacreon, Diocles, an Athenian at whose tomb lovers swear an oath, and he comments from Plutarch, it appears that the boys were of a very tender age. Euphemus, who could run over the sea, 
Euryalus, a young warrior who dies with his lover Nisus in the Aeneid, and who's extremely famous, unlike the rest of these characters. Ganymede, of course, also famous. And then weirdly, Hymone from Sophocles' Antigone. And finally, the torch race of the Hephaestia, which the writer suggests that Mr. Waterhouse might like to tackle. The writer does not assume the reader's familiarity with these rare tales, but tells the stories with assurances of the value of the subject, like a well-favored and handsome lad. Although this writer does not talk down to his readers as the AJHC writers so often do, he does fall back on code when he feels he can rely on common knowledge. Writing on Plato's famous two lines on Agathon, he inserts the lines in translation just in case, but then he says its meaning is simple enough to those who have read the Phaedrus, wink, wink. The Phaedrus, a touchstone already in Antonine Rome, as we saw in the first lecture in Michigan. But on the other hand, as well as this parade of kind of bogus erudition, the AJHC is full of mistakes and typos. A one paragraph notice of a new edition of John Addington Simmons' Studies of the Greek Poets shows the editors at their shakiest in this number four on your handout. The new edition of the Greek Poets by J.A. Simmon was urgently called for, the original work having been 10 years out of print. The latest discoveries in textual inundation have been noted in the new issue, and the writers of Herodas added. This work is the only publication which really gives the English reader who knows no Greek a true idea of what makes the peculiar and enduring merit of the Greek poets. So the implication here is, I know Greek and am highly qualified to pass judgment here, which seems unlikely on the basis of this paragraph. And not that Simmons' Greek was all that great. He famously failed his Oxford entry exam by being unable to conjugate the Greek verb to be. We saw in the last lecture that at Eton, the boys had to memorize the Greek grammar. So this is, ooh, this is saying a lot. Ooh, that was a spoiler. Um, the contributors don't only patronize their readers. Gleason White ends a savage attack on Walter Crane in one of his letters to living artists with this compliment, number five on your handout. To your praise be it told, in spite of lavish employment of the undraped figure, the similitude of God, you have never strayed into the region of the garden God, nor marred a line of your work by an impure suggestiveness. The garden god, as we've had occasion to see, is Priapus, and an assumption that the reader knows this opens up a region of impurity that's well beyond suggest suggestive. Simmons, however, was their idol. His standing is made clear in a group review published in April of 1893, a month that saw the publication of Plato and Platonism by Walter Pater, Homer and the Epic by Andrew Lang, Salome by Oscar Wilde, the New Spirit by Havelock Ellis, Michelangelo by J.A. Simmons, second edition, and The Tragedy of the Caesars by Sabine Baring Gold. The AJHC reviewer has a request, which is number five on your handout. Let Mr. John Addington Simmons supply a translation of Plato's epigrams. There is a textus receptus of those which the world best cares for, but no translations have hitherto been received. Even such masters as Shelley in poetry and Dr. Garnett in Greek have failed. Had Shelley known Greek or had Dr. Garnett been a Shelley, it had been otherwise. But Mr. Simmons is our one living poet who is saturated with the Greek spirit. He is a classicist and not a romanticist and could be trusted to throw a clear and dry light on the epigrams where even the genius and scholarship of the Swinburne, then he goes on. Um, to my knowledge, there are only one or two epigrams attributed to Plato, so it would have been a short book. Um, and Shelley did know Greek. Uh, he was at Eton from 1804 to 1810, uh, and his translation of Plato's Symposium was a faithful one. As for living poets saturated with the Greek spirit, Swinburne's Greek was good enough that he corrected Benjamin Jowett's translation of Plato. So the 
AJHC writers also tell readers how to read what is unsaid. So in reproving Sabine Berengold for his reading of the Emperor Tiberius, who was a notorious pederast, at least according to Suetonius, which we'll come back to, the reviewer explains, and this is number seven on your handout, but really we can appeal to the historians against themselves. We can read between their lines, seize on the unwilling testimony which they let slip here and there and interpret their stories in more generous ways. As we'll see, Thomas Spencer Jerome himself devoted serious attention to a revisionist history of Tiberius. Rome, when mentioned at all, is usually worse than decadent. One reviewer praises Walter Pater for treating Rome properly in his novel, Marius the Epicurean, is number eight on your handout. Mr. Pater, although he has been described as a neo-pagan, gives a flattering picture of the early Christian body and enables us to see how base and brutal was that corrupted paganism of the latter Roman Empire, which Christianity supplanted. George Ives, a friend of Edward Carpenter and of the AJHC group, follows along with the party line on Rome in his contribution to the new hedonism debate in the pages of the Humanitarians, number nine on your handout. Repudiating any excessive sensuality in association with platonic love, he writes, I have read of the filthy riots described by Cicero, of the base debauches of the empire, and of the odious banquet of Trimalchio. I know of those hateful oriental vices combining cruelty and slavery. But what have these things to do with the cold rectitude of Socrates or the sublime idealism of Plato? It was not orgiastic Saturnalia which left their impress on the works of Phidias. It was not these things that winged the soul of Hellas. Uh, it seems to me that I have read of here clearly means reading it second or third hand, as in the Gamma handbooks I discussed in lecture four, or just in the popular press. Meanwhile, Ives has no thought of Greek symposia as seen outside Plato on vases or in oratory which were certainly debauched. The most thoroughgoing indictment of Rome appears in the third part of an AJHC series titled Realism in Poetry and Fiction. This is number 10 on your handout. The critic remarks on what he calls the vivida vis animi of the Romans who are capable of being stirred by a few definite, definite emotions and who felt intensely all that they did feel. Consequently, these emotions were mirrored in their writings with vivid exactness, unblurred by any sense of underlying mysteries. Even their very language was realistic and incapable of expressing those nuances of feeling which could be so exactly caught by the subtleties of Greek idiom. In keeping close to the ground, the muse of Roman poetry has no rival, if you know what I mean. The writer particularly dislikes a certain kind of realism found in too many modern writers. He says, this is the cynical exposure of secrets known to all, not only the calling a spade a spade, but going on to particularize the compound of filth and ordure with which it may be encrusted. In Aristophanes, this is principally due to the frank license of the Dionysiac festivals. Its prominence in Catullus and Marshall seems due to the fact that it was an effective mode of flinging dirt at an enemy. Juvenal is sheltered by the satirist's plea of holding vice up to execration by depicting it in all its revolting details. There is none of that prurient curiosity and suggestiveness, that hankering after what is forbidden, which is too apparent in modern realistic literature. The photographic horrors of Juvenal are the climax etching with rigorous accuracy the images of moral putrescence. The association of photography with juvenile and immorality is of some interest here. The AJHC certainly talked about art. They favored in particular um, the naked Fisher boys painted by Henry Scott Toop. And this one hangs in the Leeds Art Gallery. And indeed the photographs taken by Wilhelm von Gluden who lived in Taormina in Sicily. Most of von Gloden's pictures are full frontal nudes, and we discussed in Friday's seminar what it is 
that makes von Glurden's images seem pornographic, whereas oil painting is perhaps less so. In any case, the esthetes were capable of seeing through their own pretenses, as you see in number 11 on your handout. This is Lionel Johnson, who has some nerve here, I must say. He writes, and since we are scholars, we throw in occasional doses of Hellenism, by which we mean the ideal of the cultured fawn. That is to say, a flowery paganism, such as no pagan ever had, a mixture of beautiful woodland natures and the perfect comeliness of the Parthenon trees, together with the elegant languorous and favorite vices of, let us parade our decadent learning, the Stratonus epigrammata. The epigrams of Strato are a much less commonly mentioned pederastic touchstone. This is a parade of learning. I discussed in the fourth lecture an edition of these Greek epigrams published in Germany in the 1700s and the long self-justification given by their editor. Indeed, these poems were almost suppressed soon after the manuscript was found in the 17th century. Note that Johnson here walls them off by giving the title in Latin, Stratonus Epigrammata. It's possible that he'd actually read them, or it's also possible that he just wanted to make it look more like he'd read them. Outside of Uranian circles, a half generation later, we find this couple who's up on the PowerPoint right now. The poet James Elroy Flecker and his close friend Jack Beasley. And I apologize for the image photographed from a book. I couldn't find a decent image online. And the one I did find is captioned, the great poet James Elroy Flecker and a lady. Um, art historians may recognize that this is John Beasley, founder of the Beasley Archive of Greek Vases, a collection which forms one of the main sources for Kenneth Dover's book, Greek Homosexuality. And Flecker and Beasley were very close friends um, while Beasley was a Cambridge undergraduate and Flecker was doing graduate work there. Um, this is from, I think, the same, the same page. Um, another, uh, sorry, this is another terrible photograph. This one shows Beasley and Flecker indulging in cosplay. Flecker is the one on the right with the goat, uh, while Beasley is reclining dressed as a shepherd boy. In their lives, classical education served as a ticket to the Eastern Mediterranean, um, just as it sent others to Italy. So here we see Edward White Benson while he was Bishop of Truro with his family. He was to become Archbishop of Canterbury in 1882. Simon Goldhill recently published a book about this family, which he calls a very queer family indeed, which is certainly true. The future Archbishop proposed to his wife, Minnie, when she was 12 years old. Uh, she went on to bear him six children. All three of his sons who lived to adulthood, along with his wife and his daughter, Maggie, showed mark homophile marked homophile tendencies in later life while maintaining a sort of plausible deniability. Hugh was friends with Baron Corvo. AC brought home a succession of handsome Cambridge undergraduates. Minnie Benson and her daughter Maggie lived for years in a menage a quatre with their respective female partners. And this is a portrait of Maggie, uh, Margaret Benson and Janet Gourlay, her partner. And then we have EF Benson. Um, a prolific popular novelist. Some of you may have read his Map and Lucia novels, which were uh, made into a series on, uh, on PBS. Um, so Benson shared a house on Capri with a friend, John Ellingham Brooks, who was endlessly translating epigrams from the Greek anthology. Now Benson had a neighbor on Capri who was indirectly responsible for our presence here today. Here's Benson, and this is number 12 on your handout, dishing his usual bitchy gossip about life on the island of Capri. Norman Douglas looked in after his day's work on South Wind, or Mr. Jerome, American Vice Consul at Naples, 
had a cup of coffee before his night's work, which often lasted till morning. He was a Roman historian of high erudition, living alone in a house encompassed by a walled garden in the center of the town. And presently, he strolled back to his bookline library to renew his labors. Just now, they concerned the emperor Tiberius. He was convinced that his supposed infamies and perverted orgies were a malignant scandal invented by the historian Tacitus. All reliable sources, said Jerome, represented the emperor as a gentle, kindly man, devoted to children, to whom he used to give delightful treats at his palace on the topmost cliff of Capri. Now this is more code, because those in the know, know from a nasty story in Suetonius, that what Tiberius did with very small children, slave children, was make them go swimming with him and nibble at his private parts. And Suetonius says he called them his pisciculi, his little fishies. And I've put the Latin on the handout, and I have to apologize for my own typo. This should say luteran, not luberan, in the second line. But if you do know the story, you know, then Benson's line is very funny um, and not very kind to Mr. Jerome. In fact, Mr. Jerome was one of the few people we've seen today who could actually read Latin and Greek though his presence on Capri belongs to the mass influx of queer people after the trial of Oscar Wilde. John Ellingham Brooks, for example, uh, Benson's housemate, was the former lover of Somerset Mom. On Capri, he briefly married the painter Romain Goddard, who, as Romain Brooks, went on to fame in Paris, um, where she was famously one of the lovers of Natalie Barney. The German arms dealer, Friedrich Krupp, developer of the U-boat, was a frequent visitor. He was outed in 1902 by an Italian socialist magazine called La Propaganda for his relationships on Capri. And he died that year after a major scandal back in Germany when the news got back there. At Friday's seminar, we saw his name among those listed in von Gluden's visitor's book in Taormina. Norman Douglas, with whom Benson begins number 12 on your handout, was in Capri to escape arrest for child rape. Although he's only well known as the author of South Wind. Uh, Jerome trained as a lawyer at the University of Michigan and he practiced law after he graduated for 10 years in Detroit. He spent a year as consular agent in Naples. In 1900, at the age of 36, only 36, Mr. Jerome bought the Villa Castello on Capri together with his older friend from Detroit, the super wealthy Charles Freer. We see them here together in the garden of the Villa Castello. Carlo Knight, in the book listed on your bibliography, gives full details of the non-binary milieu in which Freer and Jerome moved. I don't mean to bite the hand that feeds me. Jerome became a serious amateur Roman historian in the remaining 14 years of his life. In his published work, he never actually specifies what the emperor Tiberius was accused of doing on Capri by Tacitus and Suetonius. He mostly sums it up as a foul orgy and dismisses the historical accounts of the Piscicule as physically impossible, malicious gossip, a legend that is fake news. Friedrich Krupp tried to argue the same thing in response to the reports in the socialist press. And indeed this problem in writing the history of sexuality came up in Friday's seminar. Maybe all of these stories are just fake news. Mr. Jerome never claims that Tiberius gave treats to children. This is Benson's joke. Writing his memoirs in 1940, Benson, he still belongs to a generation that knew Suetonius and would get the joke. My own copy, however, of Benson's memoirs came from the library of Rock Hudson, and it seems safe to assume that Benson's joke didn't land here. For the new century brings us to the burial of Roman erotica. The pederastic novelist Horace Reed complains in his autobiography 
number 13 on your handout, that classical dress up is no longer acceptable in fiction. He complains, why should what had been academically acceptable hmm, for over 2000 years suddenly cease to be acceptable because I had translated it out of the world of dialectic into that of fiction. His novel, The Garden God, follows the usual pattern of novels about boys in love. They come to a tragic end, although his title takes us back to the Renaissance translations of the Priapia and Byron's Don Juan, as seen in previous lectures, as well as to the critical shorthand of the artist and journal of home culture. The title itself is a code, a shout out to readers, but that readership is fading. Especially the understanding of the history of same-sex love in Rome was pretty much doomed because John Addington Simmons, the great authority in Uranian circles, takes the elevation of Greece and the degradation of Rome to new heights and depths. He left a permanent anti-Rome legacy. This is the entire section on Rome in the pages of his influential underground essay, A Problem in Greek Ethics. And just in parenthesis, like how can something underground be influential? Uh, it underwent a kind of suppressed circulation that was, seems to have been more excited for being suppressed. So to clarify its publication history, it was written in 1873. It was published for private circulation in 1883 with a very limited print run for those in the know. Uh, uh, Simmons died in 1893, and then the essay was reprinted in Havelock Ellis's book, Sexual Inversion, in 1897 as an appendix. This book, in turn, was immediately suppressed. It was reprinted in 1901 in a limited edition, which was suppressed and went underground. Um, and it was finally came out into the public in 1927, when I guess people were more ready for it. Anyway, here is all Simmons has to say about Rome. And number 14 on your handout. Greece merged into Rome, but though the Romans aped the arts and manners of the Greeks, they never truly caught the Hellenic spirit. Even Virgil only trod the court of the Gentiles of Greek culture. It was not therefore possible that any social custom so peculiar as Piderastia should flourish on Latin soil. Instead of Cleomenes and Epaminondas, we find at Rome Nero, the bride of Sporus, and Commodus, the public prostitute. Alcibiades is replaced by the Mark Antony <coughs> of Cicero's Philippic. Caridon, with artificial notes, takes up the songs of Aegeanax. <coughs> the melodies of Meliager are drowned in the harsh discords of Marshall. Instead of love, lust was the deity of the boy lover on the shores of the Tiber. Now, this is cast as an historical argument. And it involves an act of sleight of hand. One, the thesis is put forward, Rome never caught the Hellenic spirit. Two, the handkerchief of Virgil is waved across the goldfish bowl of Rome. Three, the magic word, therefore, is uttered. And four, the handkerchief waves away and presto, no piderastia in Rome. Now, this is simply untrue. Unless, and this must be what's at stake, you only count as pederasty what happens between citizen boys and men, and it has to be aimed at making them nobler, unlike the deeds of the young Antony, as invented by his enemy Cicero. This was an almost unique feature of the Athenian system. Plato has one of the speakers in the symposium say as much. In fact, sex with citizen boys was illegal in both Athenian and Roman law, and in both systems, this law was dodged. But the difference is that Plato wrote, and at great length, as if that were not so. Well, in Latin erotic texts, what you mostly read about are slave boys. 19th century writers from Byron to Edward Carpenter across the board erased the role of slavery in the ancient sex gender system. They needed models that featured social equals. There is a similar silence about the legal penalties for sex that involved the penetration of a citizen male. They didn't need to look to the past for models of the anti-sodomy laws or the La Boucher Amendment. Edward Carpenter 
oops, there's Simmons, sorry. Uh, Edward Carpenter, seen there on the left, um, uh, in his book, Eolaus, follows Simmons in favoring Greeks over Romans and says you wouldn't expect much from such a crude culture. He does incorporate Virgil's second eclogue again, the love song of the shepherd Coridon, as seen first um, in the first lecture in this series, and again onwards, several poems of Catullus and even a poem by Marshall. But although Carpenter was a tireless fighter for the rights of homophile men and lived openly with his working class partner, George Merrill, seen here on the right, um, there is direct evidence that he at least directly suppressed the punitive aspect of the ancient sex gender system as Sheila Robottom demonstrates in her biography on your bibliography. The result was a distortion of ancient sexuality and reality that persists to this day. Dover centered Greek homosexuality on Eskini's uh, speech against Timarchus, which is a courtroom barrage of Athenian homophobic invective, but Foucault centered the use of pleasure on Plato and his Rome remains fixed on philosophy. In our lectures, we saw how people work within the ideological state apparatus of editions, translations, textbooks, handbooks, histories, schools, universities, curricula, examinations to control what could be thought and said. It is always open to other people to read between and outside the lines, and plenty of people have done so, though it has always been a problem for them to get in touch with each other until the web. E.M. Forster's novel Morris was suppressed by him until after his death in 1971, but it's set in 1913. In a famous scene, Morris has just sat through a university class where the professor has made the student omit a passage referring to, quote, the unspeakable vice of the Greeks. And you note the triple erasure, the omission, the word unspeakable, the unnamed vice. As they leave the classroom, Morris and his friend Durham discuss what has happened. This is number 15 on your handout. Durham observed afterwards that the instructor ought to lose his fellowship for such hypocrisy. I regard it as a point of pure scholarship. The Greeks or most of them were that way inclined and to omit it is to omit the mainstay of Athenian society. Is that so, says Morris. You've read the symposium? Morris had not and didn't add that he had explored Marshall. It's all in there, not meat for babes, of course, but you ought to read it, read it this vague. No more was said at the time, but he was free of another subject and one that he had never mentioned to any living soul. He hadn't known it could be mentioned. And when Durham did so in the middle of the sunlit court, a breath of liberty touched him. Uh, Morris discovers it could be mentioned around 1913, well after Wilde's trial, but still, word gets out by way of Plato's symposium, by way of Marshall, a writer Morris didn't want to admit to. Still, here, importantly, Morris is no longer solitary. Two readers meet and discuss the availability of texts. They almost name the subject that way inclined. They claim a revisionist history of Athens, if under the guise of pure scholarship, whatever that is, and they do so in Cambridge. They are also characters in a work of fiction that might have circulated and that did circulate. But the irony is that this scene comes from a book suppressed by its author until after his own death at a time when he still felt the subject would be viewed in England with hostility. Forster's long life made him one of those who began well inside the wood where things have no name and ended at the edge of it. Ideological shifts in the 19th century meant that texts written early on are quite different from those written later, but things in the US stayed very much underground until Stonewall. The Getty Center <coughs> owns a scrapbook made by an ordinary man, probably an American, um, around 1940. And inside it is his collection of postcards and prints of von Glurden photographs collected by him on visits to von Glurden's old villa in Taormina. He was a sex tourist, 
at a time when the desire to travel for gay men still pushed them to certain destinations. Things changed again, and recently in 2020, this massive coffee table book was published, published in Italy with its record of ordinary men in love dating back to the 1850s. So these early photographs were there for collectors to find buried in shoe boxes in junk stores. And every page of this book through what Bart calls the stupefying evidence of this is how it was, puts ordinary love into history and courts the viewer's recognition. So why have I inflicted this knowledge on those of you who don't want to know about it? Am I a fan? When I was a young professor just starting out, I used to end my course on Roman law by reading to the class Ursula Le Guin's parable, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. The moral of this story is that let the society be beautiful, glorious, full of spirit, if it depends on the suffering of a single child, then the right thing is to walk away from it. I used to say to the students, you can't be free till you know you're not. But after a long life as an historian, I no longer think it's right to walk away. I believe what Walter Benjamin said, that the historian's task is to brush history against the grain. And that is what I mean to do. I wanna give voice to the unvoiced, and read the unread. I believe that knowledge should circulate. And if that's trouble, I hope it's been good trouble. Thank you for listening. Now I wanna hear from you. I'm gonna stop this share. Okay, and I hope there's still somebody out there lecture tonight and for the entire series this week. And I don't want to push you because I know you're probably not feeling 100%. But if there are questions, let's turn to them. Please. Okay. Yeah, I feel completely fine. It's very ironic. Should I speak from here or come yeah. up there? Can you hear it? Let's try from there, please. Okay. So um, thank you very much for these lectures. I don't have my thoughts completely worked out, but. Um, you, you started off with issues of the classics and the curriculum, and you spoke about pederasty, which was openly spoken about and then became something which was hidden, right? Um, yes. And last time you uh, referred to Foucault and some disagreement, and I know that you have an article, but it also seems to be that somewhere that maybe Foucault's not taking this on because to the distortion of ancient sexuality that persists till this day, and it seems that that is, is, is that right, that, that that is actually what you are looking at, and um, control of what is thought and said in curricula, etc. And I think that, you know, maybe there's been some control here too, otherwise you might have shown more of Wilhelm von Gloden's um, um, photographs. Um, yes. And um, in a sense, could you actually say more about what is, um, talk more about what, what we don't, we are, which we refuse to accept? Because this has long been there, right? And it's, um, it's been there and it's there in many cultures. And mm -hmm. isn't it just a romantic kind of point of view to actually believe that it's not there, it's not there in Plato or something, it's sort of like passing out thinkers in a clean and unclean way, but yes. also um, there may have been different other, they, they may have been either different ideas, but they also might have been a love of violence. There's all kinds of things, but could you actually, well, I know it's not really a question, but could you address some of this? <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I disagree with the things, that, with the cover, the things that he, it seems to me, basically just didn't want to talk about, just turned aside from. And fair enough, you know, he's allowed to write about what he wants to write about, but a great many people took his description to be an exhaustive one, which is just not true. Um, 
I mean, it was very focused. However, I think that in that one famous description about, um, about the difference between um, acts and, uh, and the name homosexual, I do think that it's true that in the 19th century, as Billy Johnson lived it, there was this vast unnamed area um, that if it had been named, would have been, you know, would have been a problem. And in fact, I mean, it's probably why he was fired and it's why his colleague Oscar Browning was fired, certainly, um, in a more explicit way. Um, but so for the period of the 19th century, you do, like we can see this kind of cloudy wood where things have no names. And, and things keep changing and shifting. And there, as of right now, here, in, for this audience, in this lecture, there is no way for what von Bluten was doing um, or for what some of the people on Capri were doing. Was, you know, it is, it's not, it's a part of sexual history that, that people definitely want to bar off. But you're, I mean, I completely agree with you. It's, it's still going in parts of the world now. And, and I think, I think that, that scholars and people who think about, about what it means to be a human being and need to know these things and think about them. And, and I don't know. It's not that I'm preaching this as some kind of gospel. I, I just, I just want to not unknow it. I want it to be, I want both sides to be known, you know, the, the boys who have no voice, and then people like Billy Johnson, and then people like, um, I don't know, John Gamble Nicholson, the Uranian poets that I was talking about today, their work is all collected. You can read it in Brian Reed. And Jane Stevenson makes fun of it in Not Laban, and it's very easy to make fun of. Um, I mean, everything that's being said today about the Boy Scouts, well, Lord Badenhow was involved in this whole group. It's the founder of the Boy Scouts, and it's like actually built into the Boy Scouts. So it's it's funny and it's not funny. I don't think I have an answer to this question. Um, I I don't know if it's. These are very good questions, Amy. Yeah, I know. Um, do we have? Another question, Lindsay? Amy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much for this and your whole series of lectures, which have been quite capacious in their take on one yeah. particular thread of the classics. And my, my question has more to do with your method in this Jerome series, as opposed to the, specific, the specifics of what you've spoken about. And I'm thinking about the, the concept of reception as it exists mm -hmm. in the classics. And it seems to me that reception and the classics are sort of one in the same. I mean, it seems to me like reception is not a, nothing new in the classics, it's just what the classics mm -hmm. is. And yet we think of reception as somehow novel in, some, in other disciplines. And I, I wondered if you could speak to this. I mean, it takes a great breadth of mind to think about one particular theme in such depth over the course of two millennia, the education of a particular idea within the classics that you've charted mm -hmm. here over the course of a week, you know, over, you know, a, a thousand years, maybe more. Um, and yet we somehow think of receptions, there's like new series on reception in the classics, book series, and we mm -hmm. think that this is innovative. I wonder if you could speak to that. What, what's truly innovative about reception these days? What is innovative about reception? <laughs> 
I... Well, uh, you know, the, so the place to start from the reception is that meaning is made at the point of reception. And one of the paradoxes that's interesting to think about when you do reception is how it's impossible to control uh, the meaning of the work of art once the work of art is made. Um, but one of the things I learned from talking to you is that the, the photography, as it comes in, brings in a new medium that can radically remake the reception um, of these classical texts that I'm looking at. Um, so that you have silly photographs, like the photograph of Jack Beasley uh, and um, uh, James Elroy Flecker um, with, um, you know, with that goat. Uh, you know, photographs that show clowning around with the classical tradition, but are like so much more meaningful when you know who Jack Beasley grew up to be. Um, you see things in people's formation that make that made them read the way they are. I mean, one of the things that came up in a seminar is that among the visitors who signed Von Kluden's visitors book, among some people like Krupp, um, was Rudyard Kipling. And that completely made me read the Kipling schoolboy books. And I'm like, what is going on here? What was Kipling doing there? Maybe he was just rubbernecking. I don't know. So I'm wandering around all over thinking about your question. Um, I think that that when you that classicists, except for Homerists, um, are all doing reception because after Homer, everybody else is is reading Homer and and making art on the basis of Homer and. And that this deep layering just continues and continues and continues. But there are ruptures where people start doing something that wasn't possible before or wasn't thinkable before and which changes the discussion. And one of the things that I didn't mention in tonight's lecture is that the curriculum changed around 1900. So that these guys who were doing the artists in journal of home culture, they hadn't had to memorize the Greek grammar book. You know, they hadn't had to memorize yards and yards of Horace when they were in school. Other kinds of education were now available thanks to Charles Darwin. Um, so the, you know, the whole idea that an education was a classical education is out the window. And instead you have this kind of classical dress up that is based on a, on a wrong idea. You know, that's based on um, notions that have been passed around. So you get a kind of a, um, you know, like a phony, a phony understanding of what, what went on before. And now, today, maybe we're still in that phase, only even more so. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. But, a, lot, a lot of what you said resonates, actually. Yeah. But thank you. It's been really an enlightening week. Thanks for everything you've shared with us. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you for your call to vigilance. I am sorry you will not be able to come upstairs with us, but thank you. Please come upstairs and have a glass of Prosecco. Thank you. Bye.